Then another time I was over in a, a pot of gold ranch and I got up early in the morning there and I did a little Bible reading and prayer before the morning service started out by myself back there near the end of the camp, back end of the camp. And I was sitting there at a folding chair, about almost been about 6.30, just reading, you know, and I looked up a couple of times. One time I looked over, here the coral stick about that long. That bird was two feet from my chair. He just went along like that. I just let him go, boy, let him go. Leave him alone. Went off the side of a cliff there and went on down. Had nothing out of rock big enough to hit him with, no, no kind of hole. But the best thing you can get is a hole. A hole handle. Just stay off about 10 feet from them and cut at them. <laughs> the best thing you can do is avoid sin. That's the best thing you can do. Sin is like a serpent. Sin like a serpent. It often is beautiful. Uh, you Back in the dark ages, they had a, a, a killer machine called the Iron Virgin. And the Iron Virgin was an iron statue of Mary with the baby Jesus in her hands. And you didn't uh, notice what was wrong until it was too late. They'd take a Christian, a Bible believer, and put him in that thing. And the iron statue was hollow and it opened on hinges. And half the statue opened like this. And they put the guy in there. When he got in there in those two halves, he found himself in a place with metal spikes, like 10 penny nails, about 50 of them, stuck in that thing inside. And he closed it on it. And after leaving there for about 30 minutes, they'd open the bottom of that thing. And he'd fall in a trap door down a pile of bodies, dying and dead. And you wouldn't think a beautiful statue of the Virgin Mary with a little baby would accomplish a thing like that, would you? Sin is beautiful. It's attractive many times. And it can draw you. It's very tempting. Uh, but the wage of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Out that place where I was telling you about there in the same place, I went out and had uh, lunch one day with somebody. And coming out of the house, uh, we just walking across the driveway to the car. And the guy next to me said, Snake! And I just froze, man, just froze. And, he, and I said, where? He said, one went across there while we were eating. And there wasn't any snake there, but he saw tracks across there. And it was a dirt driveway, and while we were in eating, the snake had just gone right across there, left the tracks. And all he meant was tracks. I wish he wouldn't say it then like that. He just said, snake, and boy, I was going to freeze right on the spot. Uh, there's two animals I don't care for, snakes and sharks. And I don't trust either of them. <laughs> And back in the old days, back in the old days, we used to uh, go a lot of mullet fishing and stuff. We're always trying to figure out a way on Alabama Point, you know, to get rid of them. We, we invented some, some fancy ways of doing it, but none of it ever worked. I've taken a pistol out there and tried to shoot them. Thought the concussion would kill them and didn't do it. I think only a grenade would do it. You take, uh, you take uh, Wayne Munt, the fisherman, you know what he does? Or they did. They used to have these three-inch salutes. You can't buy them anymore, probably, but the, the three-inch salute is a big firecracker about like that and it'll burn on the water. The fuse will burn on the water. And what are you doing? They, the, the fish come up alongside the boat to get the garbage. Those folks, they go three in suits and light them and throw them in the water, and the shark, the shark would swallow them. <laughs> Boom, like that. <laughs> That'd be the end of him. <laughs> you know what the next words are? That was verse 10. You know what verse 11 says? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Those were his very next words. Why would he write about the terror of the Lord? Well, I'll tell you why. Study out the passage and see about the purpose for which we are here as the people of God, why he didn't take us to heaven the day we got saved and why we are still here upon this earth. And you can see that Paul considered the fact that if I don't live this life for the purposes that he saved me, and left me here, then it's going to be a terrifying thing to give an account to Jesus Christ. I might just remind you of this. It feels like we need it right here. I might just remind you of this about the judgment seat of Christ. We're not talking about the meek and lowly lamb. That's who came the first time. We're not talking about the meek and gentle Jesus. How many of you like me? I love reading the Gospels. I love reading through the Gospels. I read through them several times in a year. And I love reading the Gospels. And the patience of Jesus, the long-suffering of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus, the gentleness of Jesus, even with his uh, stumbling, failing disciples. And we pretty much continued the trend on all the way here to the 21st century. But the patience and the kindness and the ways of Jesus Christ. But make no mistake about this. The description is given for us of the Jesus 
that will be faced at the judgment seat of Christ. And in the book of the Revelation, in chapter 1, it says that his hair is white as wool, and his eyes are as a flame of fire. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that would be the word of God. And uh, his garment is the judicial garment that goes all the way down to the feet. And it is also the priestly garment. And it is also, did I say, the judicial garment. He is the judge. He is the king. He is the high priest. He is everything. And that's how he's going to be girded or clothed. And his feet are of fine brass. The Bible says they're of the kind of brass that's been burned, extra purified in the fire. And brass in the Bible always has to do with judgment. It has to do with the fact or it's a picture of, a type of, of the fact that there is going to be a judgment. And when it says that his feet are as fine brass as though they've been purified in the furnace, are you listening to this? It means that it will be a just judgment. There will be no miscarriage of justice when we stand before Jesus and give an account of our life. And Paul said to think about standing before him those eyes as a flame of fire. And you've got the same Bible that I do. We've all got the same Bible that Billy Graham preached out of. Philip opened his mouth, the Bible says, and beginning from this scripture, he preached, he proclaimed, he shared Jesus with him. The eunuch was reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Specifically, he was reading Isaiah 53 verses 7 and 8. We know that because Luke shares it with us in Acts chapter 8 verses 32 through 34. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. And in the New American Standard, all the capitalized letters means they're quoting from the Old Testament. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Who is this talking about? And Philip began to tell him about Jesus. He opened his mouth in verse 35 and began from this scripture he preached, he proclaimed Jesus to him. Philip explained the true meaning of the scripture to him, that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain for the souls and for the sins of men. And uh, no doubt Philip shared with the eunuch other Old Testament scriptures. Philip used the Bible to tell people about Jesus. The Bible is the reason I got turned on to the Lord. When I was an 18-year-old student 40 years ago, and I, I was back there, and I, I, 42 years ago, I was trying to find out more about Jesus. And so I just started reading the Bible, started going to Bible studies in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I just began to soak in the Scriptures. And the more I studied about the Bible, the more I learned about Jesus, and the hungrier I got. It all starts with Scripture. You've got to know the Word of God. Biblical evangelism is scriptural evangelism. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. And again, you don't have to write this down. We've got these little cards that we have laminated for you. I would just encourage you to go by. I think they're right over there. Are those what those are right there in that little hopper right there? I don't know what you call that thing. What do you call it? A little bin, whatever it is. A little holder, a little receptacle. That thing right over there, if you get it right. All right? So you get one there, and there's one right over there. they got these things. You can go by and pick them up. You can carry them in your a pocket all with you, and that's got the scriptures in there. Let me just share a few scriptures with you. Tell people that God loves them. Start with that. How about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But then tell him the same Bible also says that all of us, you included, we're all sinners. We're, we've broken the laws of God. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then tell them what sin does to them. Sin makes you dead spiritually. It kills you spiritually. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But here's the good news. Jesus came and took your death upon himself. He died in your place for your sins. He died for your sins, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates 
His own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us.